Grace and peace to you from God, our Father, and from our King, Jesus. Amen. The part that, of the Bible that the sermon is based on is the section from the Gospel according to Luke that Pastor Bitter just read, Luke chapter 25. Kings are not supposed to be crucified, are they? They're supposed to sit on thrones, not hang on crosses. Their armies are supposed to protect them, and their people are supposed to honor them. Kings are not supposed to be crucified. And yet there he is. Jesus is hanging on a cross, and the people who are around him aren't shouting, long live the king. They're mocking him. They're spitting on his feet and laughing at him and calling him names. Save yourself if you are the Christ, the chosen one of God. A soldier raises a spear with a sponge on it to his dry, cracked lips. You look thirsty, your highness, he laughs. And then with a look of pity says, save yourself if you really are the king of the Jews. Kings aren't supposed to be crucified. Why don't the people around him see? Why, why do so many turn their heads away and so many others point out his weaknesses and heap insults on him? Why is it? Well, it's because he's not the kind of king they wanted, we might say. But is Jesus on the cross the kind of king anybody wants? There's something about how weak he looks, how pathetic and alone he is that makes us turn our heads away. Jesus on the cross is so uncomfortable. But why? Why, why are humans either so quick to turn their heads away or else so quick to, to heap insults on him? Well, maybe one reason is because everything we see in Jesus on the cross is what we're afraid to look at in ourselves. Maybe one reason why people looked on Jesus with contempt is because it was so much easier to point out the condemnation in him than it was to acknowledge the guilt in themselves. Because then it's no longer funny, is it? When we are face to face with our own guilt and our own shame, it's no longer a joke. In the world of addiction, this is what people call denial, this tendency to, to look the other way, to try and, and deny the pain and the darkness that we feel in our lives, or to try and drown out the condemning voice of God's law. This is what King David did, you, right, you might remember, after he committed adultery with a woman who was married to another man, King David, the great, great king of Israel. After he found out that she was pregnant as a result of, of their sleeping together, David called her husband home from war in the hopes that she might go or that he might go home and sleep with his wife. And then that way, it would look like she had conceived as the result of sleeping with her husband, not with David. He was trying to cover his tracks. Instead of acknowledging the guilt of his sin, he looked the other direction, came up with a plan to try, and, to try and silence the condemning voice of God's law. And so maybe that's one reason why it's so hard and so uncomfortable for us to look at Jesus on the cross and in an attempt to try and drown out the voice of God's law the condemning voice, we turn the other way. Or in order to deny the, the pain and the darkness we see in him and in us, we turn and look the other direction. Because it's not just the anguish of Jesus' cross that's uncomfortable for us. It's the shame of it all. 
He's weak. And he looks pathetic. No one is coming to his rescue. And despair and death are his closest companions. And that makes us so uncomfortable because those are the things you and I fear the most. So let me ask this morning, while we have a moment away from the TVs and the phones and everything else, let me ask this morning, in what ways are you denying the pain and the darkness in your life? What secrets are you trying to cover up and hide? And they can either be things that you've done or are doing, or they can be things that someone else has done to you. How are you trying to cover it up? How are you trying to look the other way? In what ways are you trying to to drown out the condemning voice of God's law? You know, when Jesus was crucified, some people turned the other way. They looked... They looked away, but others heaped insults on him. We can get a, a sort of strange satisfaction, can't we, about the, uh, the misfortune of other people, the failures and the weaknesses of other people. This is what was happening with, with one of the criminals who was hanging next to Jesus. He, he saw in Jesus the same punishment he was getting. And so rather than come to grips with his own guilt and his own condemnation, he heaped insults on Jesus instead. Aren't you, the, aren't you God's Messiah? Save yourself. Save us. Maybe one of the ways, one of the reasons why people looked with contempt on Jesus was because it was so much easier to point out his condemnation than it was to acknowledge their own. And so another question this morning is, whose misfortune, whose weakness, whose failure are you pointing out or perhaps even celebrating in order to avoid dealing with your own? All of us need to hear the criminal's rebuke to his fellow lawbreaker. Don't you fear God since you're under the same sentence? At some point, those two men stood before a court of law. And that court of law, based on the evidence against them, uh, made a verdict over them based on what their law said. And their law said that both of those men needed to die by crucifixion because that's what the law does. It delivers justice. It's the same thing with God's good, perfect, and righteous law. It delivers justice. And in the law, there is no room for mercy. And so one of the criminals, as he hung next to Jesus, naked and exposed as the lawbreaker he was, he didn't turn his head away, but he looked straight at the guilt and the condemnation he deserved and that Jesus was fully absorbing in his body. And he threw himself at the mercy of of the supposed king of the Jews and said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said something shocking. He said, today, you will be with me in paradise. Those are the kinds of words that got Jesus into trouble in the first place. Pardoning criminals and absolving the guilty. Those are the kinds of words that seem to take away all of the control and all of the order that the law provides. And yet those words are our only hope. 
And because of the one who speaks them, we know they are trustworthy and true. We heard the Apostle Paul write that Jesus is the image of the invisible God. He's the beginning, and he is the firstborn from among the dead. If anybody can handle the guilt and the shame and the death and the despair that we so fear, it's Jesus, true God and true man from all eternity. Not true man from all eternity. Just wait. I got to back that up a second. That was not theologically accurate. True God from all eternity. Born of the Virgin Mary in time. If anybody can handle it, Jesus can. And he was dead, but now he lives forever and ever. This is why the prophet Isaiah said, surely, surely he took up all our sorrows and he carried all our infirmities. We read lots of children's stories in my house. And this last week we read one about fear. And this story was about a group of people who lived in a village in fear of a lion. They would hear this lion roaring at night. They would see it lurking in the shadows. Parents would teach their children to fear this lion, to be very afraid, and never to wander too far from the village. And if they did have to leave for some reason, to take somebody else with them. One day, everyone saw something that terrified them. In broad daylight, the lion was standing right outside the village and 10 feet away from it was a little girl. But being as close as she was to the lion, she noticed something. Its claws were missing, and so were its teeth. And so she shouted back to everyone, we don't need to be afraid. The lion can't hurt us. And the same is true of the condemnation and the death that we so fear and try to avoid. They can't hurt us anymore. We don't have to make excuses. We don't have to live in denial of it. We don't have to try and find someone who's worse than we are. Why not? Because Jesus has removed the curse of the law by becoming a curse in our place. And so the law has its place and its purpose but its teeth are gone. That's why the Apostle Paul said, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. None. It is finished. So the next time that you look at Jesus on the cross and you start to feel uncomfortable and you're tempted to turn your head away, look straight at him and say, King Jesus, remember me. And he does. And he will. Because the chosen one has chosen you. And he will come again in glory and his kingdom will have no end. So now to the king, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, the honor and glory and thanks and praise forever and ever. Amen.